Now, the water is very important part of the dialysis machine or dialysis treatment. It has to be, uh, it has to be very pure. They have certain guidelines for uh, how pure the water should be. So now this is the water treatment system uh, uh, flow diagram in our unit. So what we have is a water source, which can be usually a ground source or uh, a municipal water source. And uh, there's something called as black backflow preventer. So once the water enters, it will not go back. And uh, we have the basic filter, which is a 0.5 microman, uh, micrometer filters. Once that is passed, the basic sediments will get removed, like dust and anything will be removed. And then after that, there'll be softener. And the softener is nothing but uh, hyperchlorate, hyper, uh, uh, hyperchlorated sodium, uh, this thing, which is uh, called as brine. And once the water is softened, it has it goes to the worker carbon bed. And worker carbon bed is nothing but uh, to prevent uh, any impurities in the water. And then it will go into reverse osmosis. And then it will go into UV sterilization. And finally, there will be a filter called as entropsin filter, which is 0.3 micrometer filter. And once that is done, it will, the water is ready to use. This is the water treatment system. For the dialysis. Now, generally, we send water for um, uh, testing for every month. Uh, actually, you have to go forward, uh, Lavanya. Next, next, next slide. Next. Yeah. Next slide. Oh. So we check for multiple elements uh, in the water. So we keep a track of how pure the water is. So we generally check aluminum, chloramine. Chloramine we're checking very frequently nowadays because uh, of the groundwater problem, we're getting municipal water where they use chloramine to kill the impurities. So once the chloramine is more in the water, again, they'll have reactions. The, uh, the body will not tolerate the chloramine. They can have reactions and hemolysis also. And we'll be checking uh, other uh, elements. And uh, we send this water for culture also. I'll be showing the guidelines for how pure the water should be. Those are called as AMI guidelines. So we give culture, but the culture should show it, uh, less than 200 colony forming units. And uh, the European pharmacopoeia guidelines says the culture should show less than 100 colony forming units. And uh, we check endotoxin levels. It should be less than uh, 0 0.1 endotoxin units per ml. Now, uh, once we're dialyzing a patient, we should know how adequately we're dialyzing the patient. So that there's the certain parameters which we look uh, at, uh, we measure uh, while we're dialyzing the patient. The first one is, uh, so uh, yeah, these are, uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so these are uh, the uremic toxins. So some are free, uh, uh, water soluble, some are protein bound, and some are middle molecules. Middle molecules are small molecules uh, based on uh, the size of the molecule. So these are the middle molecule uh, compounds. Uh, which are uh, removed, uh, which are removed actually less during the dialysis. So to remove these middle molecules, instead of hemodialysis, we do something called as hemodiafiltration. Uh, 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 hemodiafiltration is nothing but hemodialysis with convection. And diffusion and convection we use simultaneously. It's called as hemodiafiltration. Now uh, we do something called as URR and KT by V to, to see the adequacy of the, uh, adequacy of the dialysis. So we measure something called as urea reduction rate. So this is for a single dialysis session. Next slide, Lavanya, next slide, please. Yeah, so it should be around 65 to 70%. So what uh, this is only for a single session. So when you do one session of dialysis, the uh, urea before the dialysis, after the dialysis, divided by urea before the dialysis into 100, that is called, that's the formula for the URR. So basically we have to maintain a urea reduction rate of around 65 to 70%. Then only we can call it as adequate uh, dialysis. Now, we have something called as urocantic models also, which is not important for you. And what you have to understand is there's, some, there's another uh, way of measuring uh, the dialysis because generally we prescribe two or three dialysis per week. When we do a URR, it will tell you only how adequate a single session of dialysis is. But when you take into account multiple sessions of dialysis, we do something called as KT by V, which is a dimensionless uh, measurement. Uh, any KT by of 1.2 is uh, is defined as adequate analysis. Next slide, uh, Lavanya, please. Yeah, so KT by V. So uh, no need to mug up. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big formula. So I don't think you can remember that. Just remember this much that uh, you need to you do two uh, two two. Uh, things to measure the adequacy of the dialysis. One is the URR, one is the KTP. URR is for the single session, KT by V is for multiple sessions. Again, in KT by V, we have something called a single pool KT by V, 
uh, equilibrated KT by V, the multiple KT, uh, things in KT by V also, which will be too much if I tell you now. So we'll just uh, uh, skip those things now. I can change the slides, Lavanya. Next slide. So these are nothing but uh, KT by V's uh, for you. Should I go to next slide, doctor? Yeah, next slide, next slide, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So the the uh, the recommendations which is given by KDGO by uh, KDGO is um, uh, at least three times a week of dialysis. That should be at least twelve hours per week for adequate clearance. And uh, this is the uh, you know a very crude way of saying uh, whether you're getting adequate dialysis or not. But if you go and dig into details, a single session of URR of around sixty five percent and a standardized KT by V of one point two is defined as adequate dialysis. Now again, you have multiple. Uh, um, uh, recommendations for multiple bodies. You have European best practice guidelines also more or less telling the same thing. And dialysis dose should be monitored every month to see whether the patient is getting adequate dialysis or not. So yeah, next slide. Yeah, equilibrated KTV 1.2, uh, higher dose of 1.4 can be tried. And uh, yeah, that's about uh, the adequacy of the dialysis. The other methods also uh, to determine the adequacy, one is the time average urea concentration. We have uh, solute removal index, and you have KT, which is not normalized by body volume. So these are not required for you, it will be too much. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. So this is very important for you. What are the components of dialysis prescription? So when you, whenever you want to dialyze the patient, uh, uh, what are the things you tell to your technician uh, to, uh, to, to process the dialysis? So the first thing is how many hours you want to do dialysis and uh, how frequently, once in a week, twice in a week, thrice in a week. For everybody, generally, we start two hours a week. And we please, just give me one second, sorry. Hi, everyone. The doctor is just joining. Sorry. So, how many times you're going to dialyze the patient? That's the second thing. One twice a week, twice a week. What is the access? Whether you have a temporary access or a permanent access like every fistula. We have temporary access in the form of temporary catheter and uh, tunneled catheter, which is tucked into the skin. What kind of dialyzer you're using? What membrane? Generally, we're using a polycell phone membrane with what surface area? For example, you have a small child, you have a big person. You don't use the same uh, dialyzer for everybody. So you choose based on what is the surface area of the, uh, you calculate the surface area of the patient and then you prescribe the dialysis. And what blood flow rates you want to maintain. So ideally, blood flow rates and the dialysate flow rates. So uh, blood flow we maintain around 250 to 300. Dialysate flow by default will be double that of the uh, blood flow rates to maintain the maximum clearance. How much water you want to remove and uh, what is the dialysate composition? You want to change any dialysate composition. What, whatever I showed is the standard dialysis composition. For example, you have a patient with very high calcium, we use zero calcium dialysate. You have a patient with very high potassium, we use zero potassium dialysate. And uh, you also should tell what is the anticoagulation required for the patient, how much you use. Apparent generally we use for everybody. And uh, again, uh, we have we use uh, different doses for different people. So there's a standard protocol for that also. And uh, what's the dialysate temperature and interdialytic medication, anything needs to be given or not. So all these things will be uh, part of your prescription. Now, what are the other methods of dialysis? So what normal dialysis is called is hemodialysis or IHD, intermittent hemodialysis, where, as I told you, we maintain a normal blood flow of around 250 to 300, and dialysate flow of usually it will be double, so it will be around 800, uh, 600 to 800. Now, we have something called a SLED, which is a slow and low efficacy dialysis, which is done exactly same like intermittent hemodialysis, 
but just your prescription will change. So instead of maintaining very high blood flow, you maintain a very low blood uh, uh, blood flow because usually sled is done in patients in ICU settings who are hemodynamic and it's unstable. And uh, so we don't want uh, very high blood, uh, blood pump speed because again, it will change the hemodynamics of the patient. And once the blood flow comes down, your dialysate flow also comes down. The clearance will definitely come down because of the low blood flow and the low dialysate flow, but the hemodynamics are better maintained. So generally you've done in hemodynamically unstable patients, acute kidney injury patients rather than the chronic stable hemodialysis patients. Now the other thing we have is a hemofiltration. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, convection plus diffusion, which is the latest version of uh, dialysis or best version of the dialysis. The advantage of hemofiltration is that with hemodialysis, uh, you remove only the small molecules, whereas the middle molecules or large molecules are left behind, which can cause a lot of inflammation in the body. So when you use hemofiltration, these molecules are also removed, and then you have better survival benefit, better anemia profile in these patients. The blood hemoglobin will, uh, will maintain... Uh, uh, will maintain with less erythropoietin injections and uh, less cardiovascular mortality and all those things with the hemodiafiltration. We have different methods in that, CBVHF, CBVHDF, and uh, CBVHD also. Okay. So it's diffusion plus convection basically. And we have something called a scuff. Scuff is uh, nothing but uh, when we remove only fluid, generally we do for cardiac patients. And uh, the, it's also called as aquaferesis because uh, it's only done for the volume. Generally, in these patients, the renal functions are more or less normal because of the poor heart, there'll be a lot of accumulation of water in the body, which we remove. So this is my department, uh, uh, the consultants and our residents. And uh, next slide, please. This is my dialysis department. Uh, these are my sisters and technicians. And this is the dialysis unit where my sisters are working. We have a big unit. Uh, thank you.